We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, uh, continuing uh, with Paul and uh, our uh, kind of the major theme that we uh, kind of showed you last week with a little, with a little cartoon. Uh, whenever we get that up, we showed you a, uh, an image of an apple core, and it's an Indian. It's one core Indian, uh, and he is spanking the, the saints, and that's what's going on. The first thing that Paul is spanking the saints over is the, the division that is within the church. Some are saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, uh, I'm of Cephas or, or Peter, I'm of Jesus, and so forth. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the division is rooted in pride, and uh, Paul deals with it uh, by a very uh, opening uh, introduction that was very gracious, and then he focuses uh, on the cross uh, and on their own testimony. He says, not many of you were wise, uh, not many of you were mighty, not many of you uh, were noble, and uh, talking about where they had come from. And this is a pretty gnarly church. I mean, we've kind of covered that in the first background, and we've said uh, in, the, in the way that Athens was the capital or the center for uh, uh, Greek philosophy and intellectualism, Corinth was the center for sensuality, sexuality. And so uh, the, um, they were steeped uh, in it because of the temple of Aphrodite that was there, a thousand uh, temple prostitutes on the streets uh, uh, every, every night. Uh, and they were also, of course, uh, entrenched in Greek philosophies. And they were used to arguing some 50 schools of philosophy in, uh, in Corinth and, and, and debating. And then they, they brought that mentality right over into the church and debated over personalities uh, uh, as well. Uh, Paul tries to get them to, to remember the cross. He's going to bring that back in, uh, in this section. We'll, we'll see that. Uh, but in terms of the big picture, uh, he's saying that... Um, there's two contrasting ideas here, the wisdom of the world or, or the wisdom of God. Uh, you can either follow one and have one or follow uh, the other. And now, again, he's, we're kind of titling this the believer in, in God's wisdom uh, because it becomes, I think, a little more applicable. The, the other things that are in here, I, I think just in terms of application, it'll become a little obvious as we go along. Paul becomes certainly quite the model for ministry for us, for preaching, for teaching, for why we do what we do, uh, and I, uh, at least here on Sunday morning with us, and I think you'll probably uh, see that uh, as, as well. Uh, there's always, and there's always been, a temptation in ministry to, to mimic what is successful uh, in, in the world, uh, and uh, that's gone on for a long time, uh, and we're in the current phase of it now with a couple of uh, uh, different models uh, that believe that... Um, that Christians should be, uh, uh, be entertained uh, and, uh, uh, and people should be entertained uh, in order to come and give them a reason to come. Uh, and you have to be careful about your words and don't mention sin. Don't ask people to bring a Bible because uh, uh, people might show up without a Bible and then they would feel left out. And we'll sing to you because people are not used to singing and so forth. So it's a, it's a whole different, uh, different mindset. <laughs> I remember... Uh, uh, just kind of one of the kids' birthday party uh, out on the Marine Base here a couple of years ago, and I met a, a couple that were, uh, uh, they were friends, and uh, they were of, uh, of the Pazulis, and uh, they were there, and they were believers, and they, they lived on the other side of the island, and I was asking, we were talking about where they went to church and stuff, and they said, yeah, yeah, we, we uh, it took us a while, uh, and we finally ended up, uh, I think they live in Kapolei, and they were driving the North Shore Christian Fellowship. Uh, and they and I sell them my new mic and uh, love the ministry out there. And they said, "Yeah, we love it. We, uh, yeah, we, it took us a while. We were just we we kept going to those churches where where they uh, where the, it was all <laughs> where it was all a light show and smoke during during the uh, the worship. And we just kind of wanted you know to worship God and learn the Bible. <laughs> and uh, she, it was interesting. It took it took them a while to find that. But it's uh, uh, there's some things in here that are certainly applicable to. Uh, the church and the state of the church, as well as the influence of the world uh, over us. Well, that was a longer introduction than I wanted, so let's uh, jump in here. Uh, verses 1 to 5, we're seeing that the wisdom of God must first be seen in the crucifixion. Uh, and I, I, brethren, what I came to you did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of hum human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, 
your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power uh, of God. Well, we're going to go on in our text, but why don't we uh, pause for a moment of prayer. Father, we, uh, we do come and we're thankful that uh, your work in our midst is in a demonstration of, of your power to transform our lives. And the preaching of the cross and the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ needs to be uh, central to, uh, to our message, to understand that before we can go any further in terms of what Paul's going to refer to as the deep things of God. These are the things for every believer, and we pray that through your word you would reveal them to us this morning, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So Paul did, uh, in terms of this, um, the wisdom of God must seen uh, in the crucifixion, we're saying Paul uh, didn't use dramatic speech or wisdom when, when he was preaching. Now, um, yeah, Paul was, you know, if you read his, you know, you go through Romans or any of the epistles, you, you certainly get the impression that... Um, Paul was a pretty intellectual guy, and of course he had a tremendous education, uh, not only uh, in terms of Tarsus where he grew up, uh, in, in the Greek culture, uh, able there in Mars Hill in Acts 17 to quote, quote their own poets to them, uh, but uh, again he was a Pharisee, uh, he was uh, the son of a Pharisee, he studied uh, at the feet of Gamaliel, according to Judaism today, one of the greatest rabbis that's ever lived, so Paul had risen among his peers, so he was highly educated. So when he says, I didn't come to you with persuasive words, uh, what he's saying is that I didn't come and when I spoke or when I taught you the word of God, because Acts 18, 11 says, Paul, <clears throat> so Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word, the word of God. So, but he didn't come and do it in a manner that would be like the Greek orators of, of their day. Uh, so it was, um, it was, uh, it was probably conversational. Uh, it was simple. It was so people could uh, understand it. He didn't have to use great flowing, uh, flowery language and raising his voice as he spoke out over, the, you know, and uh, he didn't, he wasn't like that. Paul was just, uh, he didn't go that way. Uh, there was a way, and uh, we get that term uh, from this era uh, of speakers, that term spellbinding. You know, sometimes we say, uh, Somebody was uh, a spellbinding or a movie was spellbinding. It means, boy, we were just entranced uh, uh, into what they were saying. Uh, and there are some people that are, that are so good at public speaking, uh, I would say they're, they're spellbinding. Uh, the, the trouble is uh, uh, it's not always what they say or the content. Uh, it's just the manner in which they did it. And Paul says, I never came to you uh, in that way. Uh, the way he came was very different than the wisdom of the world. Uh, he, he first says, I didn't come for my, my own glory. That's in the opening statement, uh, and I, or it can be translated accordingly. Uh, and notice he says, I didn't come for myself. I came for the glory of God. Paul didn't come to start a religious fan club as the itinerant philosophers would during, during that day. Uh, he didn't come again with eloquent speech, clever arguments. Uh, he was, uh, as one writer said, an ambassador, not a Christian salesman. And, uh, uh, and again, it's why we do a lot of what we do and the way we teach and the style that we teach and so forth. Uh, and, and if you don't know it, uh, uh, it, it really all comes from, from Pastor Chuck. Uh, Pastor Chuck ends up in the middle of a revival with a bunch of hippies that had no Christian background at all, never been to church uh, in, in their lives. Uh, and he kind of had to change the way he taught. He kind of had to sit there and just talk it through with them like uh, and that's why you, li you listen even, of course, to the recordings of Chuck, and you, if you listen long enough, you feel like you're listening to your grandfather telling you stories about the Bible, and it's just really easy to sit there and, and, and listen to Chuck. It's not with eloquent speech. Uh, it was very simple, very simple, and I think that's part of what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He came for God's glory, and uh, uh, I don't know, Paul may have been capable of speaking this way, but he refrained from it. Uh, no, he also came as a as a humble servant. Notice the phrase, uh, uh, he talks about being weak. Uh, of course, this is something he knows in terms of uh, when he's weak, that's when God can truly uh, make him strong, and that's certainly true uh, of us as well. The phrase uh, fear and trembling, uh, he uses in several other passages, also in 2 Corinthians, uh, in Ephesians, uh, in Philippians. Uh, this seems odd for us to hear the Apostle Paul use a phrase uh, like this uh, with fear and trembling. And it needs to be understood in its context. Paul, Paul lived a very bold life for Jesus Christ. He preached in a very bold way. 
he encouraged other people to be bold for Jesus Christ. So what does he mean by fear and trembling? The fear and trembling is, is the concern for the people. Uh, he knows where, what he, again, in that day, if you were called a Corinthian, it was a slang term for somebody that was completely immoral. He was in fear and trembling of presenting the gospel and having it not received. Sometimes people ask me, uh, well, you've been doing this a long time. Do you, uh, do you ever get nervous? I said, well, not, not really. I don't get nervous in the sense of uh, I'm afraid to get up in front of a group of people and so forth. And believe me, I was. The first, the first time I ever had to uh, get up at church was at Calvary Honolulu. Pastor Bill asked me to do the announcements. And I was really glad that there was a pulpit because that way people couldn't see that my knees were knocking together. And I thought that was a figure of speech. I didn't know that it was actually happened. I was, I was, it was the, a dread. I was just so thankful that I survived the 90 seconds of whatever I had to say in terms of the, the, what was in the bulletin. My life, life flashed before me several times. And, uh, and then afterwards, I just thought, well, praise God, that's over with. And the bill said, well, that was good. We'll just have you do it every week. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what have I done? But after a while, you do get kind of used to it. Uh, but what you don't ever and you shouldn't ever get used to uh, is, is to do it with fear and trembling uh, because there's a lot of responsibility here in terms of what we're presenting and in terms of God's word. Are these my words or God's words? Am I saying something beyond what God would have me to say? Paul was very afraid that when he got up and preached the gospel, would he be accurate and would it be received? Because there would be no hope for these people otherwise. There is no hope beyond the gospel. And anytime we share the gospel with anybody, it should be with fear and trembling. It's not a, well, I'll take it or leave it, going to hell or heaven, take your pick. It should, never, it should always be. It should always be with fear and trembling. It, it's not a weakness the way we, we think of it. Uh, it's a concern for uh, who is receiving the message. He came as a humble servant uh, and declared a, a, a testimony. Look at the second half of verse 1. He did not come with excellent speech or of wisdom declaring to you, Notice it was the testimony of God. Uh, he didn't, again, come as a witness to uh, Greek philosophy. He came as a testimony uh, or a witness. Uh, materion is the word uh, in the Greek. It's a witness in, in a courtroom uh, where, where the person is supposed to get up there objectively and factually and personally uh, give their eyewitness to what they, they, they saw or did. And that's what Paul was, was doing uh, he would say, uh, similar to uh, writing the same church the second time in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, he says, uh, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience uh, in the sight of God. Uh, and uh, in Acts 24, 16, Paul says, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man in the way that he preached, he taught the way that he handled uh, the, the Word of God. He says, never, never deceitfully. It's never be to be manipulated. Uh, do people use God's Word to deceive and manipulate? Yeah, big time. Uh, they, they do it all the time. Uh, but they, Paul never, never did in, in his ministry. Uh, a number of years ago, I should say, a few decades ago, <laughs> when uh, Raul Reese's uh, uh, film about his life and his testimony uh, had first uh, come out. Uh, uh, he came over with it, uh, and we were uh, we were going to we set this whole thing up to do an outreach at Midpack High School. Uh, we were going to uh, show the film, and Rawl was going to get up and uh, share afterwards, share the gospel, uh, give a, an opportunity for people to know the Lord. Uh, and uh, I was uh, meeting with all and overseeing all of the the follow up people that were there. Uh, we were kind of talking, making sure everybody had materials. We had a game plan and so forth. Uh, and then uh, one of the guys, um, uh, and I, I probably, um, probably had about uh, 20, 20 people as follow-up counselors, which turned out to not be enough, uh, which was uh, very interesting. But um, one of the guys uh, came up to me and he says, uh, uh, well, uh, hey, listen, when, when Raul gives the altar call, should all of us just kind of get up and come forward, you know, kind of like we're getting saved to kind of prime the pump? I was shocked that he even said it, but I guess it happens. And I said, absolutely not. I mean, it's either God's going to convict people of their sin, they're wanting to get saved, it'll be a work of God, or we're not going to do it. No, don't, don't do that. That'd be terrible. And he, so he sheepishly went, went on his way. And it was great because uh, 
uh, it, was, it was kind of a rowdy crowd because you know, you were all, again, you know, kung fu guy and all this stuff. And a uh, former Marine, we had uh, a bunch of kids that came from uh, Farrington uh, up there. And, uh, and, and one of the biggest, toughest kids in this whole group of uh, teenagers, high school kids, uh, was the first guy that came forward uh, uh, by himself, alone. Uh, but it wasn't long to there were 40, or 40 50 people that came, uh, came forward. And, uh, you know, again, the, then it was scrambling to try to have enough uh, counselors for, uh, for everybody afterwards. Uh, Paul never came deceitfully or manipulative. Uh, th- this should be the model for ministry, and unfortunately, it's not, because it's easy, even as believers like these believers, to fall into the wisdom of the world, but uh, we're not supposed to do that. Secondly, Paul was determined to preach only Christ crucified, and uh, so similar writing to the church in, uh, in Galatia, uh, and uh, in that chapter 6, verse 14, he says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I, I, I to the world. So Paul needed uh, to lay the foundation. Does this mean that Paul, for a year and a half, uh, taught topically uh, on, uh, on messages that always dealt with the crucifixion and the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ? No, it's not, that's not what it means. But it means this, this is how we began. And there's no point going any farther until the person comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, He doesn't need to sit down and teach them Bible study after Bible study if they haven't received the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ for their lives. The Pharisees knew the Bible backwards and forwards, but none of them were saved. Paul did not want to go out uh, into the Greek world and try to establish a new sect of Judaism of people that are like Pharisees. That had all the information of the world, but it would never make any transformation in their lives because they had never come to faith uh, in, uh, in Jesus Christ. He taught, uh, in his own words in Acts 20, the full counsel uh, of God. And as I've already quoted Acts 18, 11, he spent a year and a half teaching them or teaching through uh, the, the word of God. But you can't build a house until you lay the foundation. And the foundation is the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, his crucifixion. Thirdly, Paul came in the demonstration of the Spirit uh, and of the power of God. And uh, I think this, uh, if you read this alone, it probably, you think it means something that it really doesn't. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you there are several things in this passage that probably mean something that, <laughs> that, that uh, uh, you're, you're unaware of. And this is one of them. I think we read this and we think, well, that means there was a lot of miracles. Now, Paul already said very clearly, the Jews ask for a sign, but that's not what I'm here for. Uh, uh, The demonstration of power was the actual message of the gospel and its ability to transform uh, a a person's life. You know, sometimes when uh, when someone comes to faith in Christ at some kind of evangelistic event, it's good to give them some follow-up material. And in that follow-up material, there's always a lot of verses from uh, the Gospel of John uh, to help them have an assurance of their salvation, to know that it's really by their faith and by their faith alone. Uh, And that's a really a good thing. But primarily, primarily, a person should know they're saved because of the power of God working in their lives. If you've come to faith in Jesus Christ and your life has never changed a bit, I would say you still need to come to faith in Jesus Christ because His Spirit works powerfully uh, in, in our lives and should be working in our lives. Uh, when I came to, to faith in Christ, I, uh, I, uh, I uh, you know, grew up in the church, so I knew, I, you know, youth group, all that. I knew the four spiritual laws. <clears throat> I probably got an award for memorizing them or something. There was something, I'm sure, compelling, a trip to Disneyland. I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, yeah, you do what you got to do, and... Uh, uh, but uh, when I kind of got the, to the end of my rope, uh, I didn't have to turn on the radio or the TV. I, I knew, you know, I just got down and, uh, and prayed to receive the Lord, asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I really didn't know if he would forgive me at that juncture in my life. Uh, I didn't really know. I was just praying that in God's mercy, he would forgive me of my sins uh, and, uh, and, uh, and take me uh, into his family. Uh, what I found out was in the ensuing days and weeks that is that he had done that because I began to see the power of God work in my life and ch- make changes in my life. 
Uh, and, there, and by the time I was a few months into it, uh, nobody had to show me a Bible verse that told me how I was saved. I knew that I was saved. Uh, and that's what Paul's talking about here. Uh, I didn't come to you and people weren't saved because I did a lot of miracles. He's already covered that. People don't get saved from being miracles. Uh, people get saved, and when they do, there is a demonstration of power, a transformation that takes place uh, in, uh, in their lives. Uh, and the wisdom of God is centered around the crucifixion, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Uh, and when it is foremost, uh, it is transformational in terms of, in terms of our lives. Now, and I realize that um, uh, some people are... <laughs> were, we're a lot, um, there was a lot to be transformed in my life, so it was a little more obvious. And, uh, uh, and there's a lot of people that, uh, uh, especially the kids that get, get saved, um, it, maybe the transformation isn't quite as obvious, but it's, uh, uh, it's still there. Uh, it's still the power of God. Uh, the wisdom of the world would say, would say otherwise, uh, but Paul would uh, differ with the wisdom of the world. It should impact the life of the believer. Secondly, the wisdom of God is contrasted now in four ways to the wisdom of the world in verses 6 to 9. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So again, the contrast I'm seeing is in four ways. Uh, the first contrast is seen in how God's wisdom brings, brings maturity to believers. And this is one of those when, uh, when you read it and you read that word maturity, uh, you assume... <clears throat> that's a person that uh, he's been walking with the Lord for a period of time and studied the word. And he's going to get on and mention that this is the person that knows the deep things of God. And you think, well, man, I hope to get there someday. I'm not quite, that, that's not what it says. The mature person is the person that is saved. Uh, this, we, we can use that word in the English uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in maturity to mean someone that, that is, that, uh, that uh, is, is mature. Uh, that uh, has grown, that is able to make dis good decisions and have discernment, be, re be responsible for their lives and, uh, and so forth. But uh, that's not the, the word that's here. Uh, Tetelios is, uh, is the Greek. It's used in uh, Hebrews 10, 14 of the fact that uh, Christ's sacrifice for us makes us perfect. Uh, and uh, again, so when we, so Paul's talking about every believer here. Uh, there's a, a contrast. God wants and does give wisdom to every believer. And we kind of saw that a little bit uh, last week. It can be experienced by all of us, which leads to the second contrast in terms of God's wisdom. It's seen in the revelation of his wisdom. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a, in a mystery. And uh, again, this term is, doesn't mean, again, what it does in English. In English, when we say something's a mystery, it's something we don't know we're hoping to know. Somebody writes a murder mystery. You don't know who committed the murder till you get to the end of the story. Uh, but in the New Testament, uh, when this word is used, it's talking about something that we didn't know before, but we know now. We didn't know it, <clears throat> but now we know it. And it's used of several, several things in, uh, in, the, in the New Testament. The church was a mystery. Uh, those, those guys in the Old Testament could have never conceived that one day there would be a thing called the church that would be Jews and Gentiles together, uh, worshiping God. That was a mystery. That was a mystery. Didn't know it before. We, <clears throat> we know it now. Jesus was a mystery in terms of coming in all the fullness of the Godhead. They were looking for the Messiah. They believed the Messiah would come. They knew certain scriptures about him. Uh, they didn't see it coming that it would be God come in the flesh. Uh, the incarnation uh, of Jesus was, was really a mystery uh, to, uh, to many uh, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament saints. Uh, the gospel itself, that people would be saved by placing their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That was a mystery, uh, but it's now been revealed. So when Paul says in verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, something we didn't know, but we know now, 
uh, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages uh, for our, our glory. Again, the hidden wisdom before uh, is the gospel uh, itself. Uh, it was hidden wisdom. How was it hidden? Uh, well, it was there. Uh, they just didn't see it. How was it there? It was in the sacrificial system. Uh, the whole thing, the Bible says uh, the, the life is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of, uh, of sins. All the, all the time those animals were sacrificed, it was a picture of one day that uh, God himself would come and be sacrificed uh, for our, our sins. It's in the Passover celebration. Uh, we see it when we uh, do Passover together here. Uh, <clears throat> what, what is Passover? Again, it's, it's the time uh, in the past where <clears throat> the people of God took a lamb and sacrificed it, put its blood over their doors in obedience to God. Uh, and because of that sacrifice and the shed blood of a lamb, the angel of death passed over. Well, that's a picture of what Jesus Christ has, uh, has done for us. It's in the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. Uh, when the priests would go in and make those sacrifices, there would be one goat that would be sacrificed, there would be another that would be sent into the wilderness. Our sins would be sent far away to be remembered no more. We could go on and on, even how the construction of the tabernacle. Uh, the gospel was hidden, Paul says, but now it's been revealed for our glory. Uh, we understand it. Uh, we grasp it. Why, why would we want to look to, lean to the wisdom and the thinking of this world when the gospel's been revealed to us, because we're mature, we've become believers in Jesus Christ. It's all been predicated on what I gave to you. I didn't tell you anything else until you understood the gospel in Christ's substitutionary death. Again, it's what we call shadows and, and types. Paul says, uh, <clears throat> this might be a, a good time to mention this, wisdom does not come from political leaders. <clears throat> I don't know if you saw that in the second half of verse 6, nor are the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So I'd just like to say of everybody running for president this year, they're all coming to nothing. <laughs> and they're not going to really help us in terms of, in terms of the things of, things of God. Yes, I have my favorite. I hope he wins. But um, it's all in the hands of God. I just pray for his mercy and, uh, and, uh, and not what we deserve as, uh, as a country. Uh, but the rulers of this age, those people that are over us and so forth, uh, what's his example? He says, well, look at the rulers of my age, uh, the ones that crucified Jesus Christ. Do you think they had a lot of wisdom? Do you want to look to them? They have no wisdom or they would have never crucified. And notice uh, very uh, interesting, the Lord of glory. Paul throws in here a little reference to the deity of Christ. He's quoting Psalm 24, uh, verses 7 to 10, where it says, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who's the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He's the king of glory. Who's the king of glory? Jehovah God. Who is Jesus Christ? Jehovah God. It's just a line, but, it, but uh, some writers say there's at least... 80% quote or allusions in the New Testament to things in the Old Testament. And uh, this is one of those subtle ones that Paul is making reference to who it was that was crucified that is the foundation uh, of our faith. Jesus echoing the same thought on the cross said, Father, forgive them of these leaders. They do not know what they do. The third contrast is seen in the eternity of, of God's wisdom. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which Notice, God ordained before the ages. That's the word predestination translated most other places. This is God's plan all, all along. Uh, he planned it out. Uh, even planned that uh, you and I would come to know him. Paul, in writing to the church at, uh, at Ephesus in chapter 1 of verse 5, 4 and 5, uses this same phrase. There he says wonderfully, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, uh, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined, that's the same word, ordained, us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure uh, of his will. This was uh, God's great, great plan in heaven. Uh, when, uh, when God created the earth and put uh, man on the earth, uh, and Adam and Eve sinned, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were not shocked. 
Uh, they didn't at that juncture think, well, one of us is going to have to go and remedy this situation. And the three of them went, junk in. No, they didn't do that. It was God's plan for him from all eternity. Uh, Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, he wasn't until he died on that Roman cross 2,000 years ago. But in the mind of God, it was, it was already his plan. It had already, already happened. The wisdom of the world doesn't really understand that, does it? That God could look ahead uh, in the future and see these things and plan our salvation. Uh, but, he, but he has before the creation of the world. Fourth, the fourth contrast in terms of the wisdom of the world that Paul mentions here It's seen in our immediate future because of God's wisdom. Uh, And this is one, again, where I think we kind of miss the point here, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And uh, if uh, I just read that verse, and uh, I won't do a show of hands, but if uh, uh, I said, uh, how how many of you think that this is talking about heaven someday? It's going to be awesome. Uh, I would say... Most of us would raise our hand. That's not what he's talking about. He's actually talking about right now. He's talking about here and now. Heaven's going to be awesome, and I think that's a a good application uh, of the verse. But that's not what the verse is talking about. He's quoting Isaiah 64.4. He's quoted uh, Isaiah a couple of times now. It's during the Isaiah's uh, prophesying during the Babylonian captivity. uh, And uh, Jeremiah said that uh, 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 the people will come back after 70 years. Uh, Isaiah is encouraging the people. He's saying, he's saying, things look very bad right now. Circumstantially, things look horrible. The temple is burnt to the ground. You're in captivity. It seems like you'll never go home and things will never be right again. But I want to tell you something. You haven't seen anything yet. God is not done with you. God still has a plan for you. Eye is not seen. Ear is not heard. Right now, in your life, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He's talking about right now. He's not talking about heaven will be awesome. I think that's an application of the verse. That's not what he's talking about here, though. He's saying that, but God has revealed them through us, uh, through, through the Spirit. We can follow the wisdom of, of the world, or we can follow the wisdom of God. It's Paul's uh, argument here, we should be following the wisdom of God. The rulers of this age, wow, they're all going to come to nothing anyway. Uh, There's a tremendous contrast between what God can do in our lives because he knows everything, the end from the beginning, compared to what we can learn or know from someone who is a so-called philosophical expert uh, in our lives now. Follow the wisdom of God, Paul says, and uh, you'll be amazed. So the wisdom of God must first be seen in the crucifixion. You'll never experience it uh, apart from salvation. Uh, The wisdom of God is contrasted to the wisdom of this world. Uh, And there's some conditions now that he wants to lay out in verses 10 to 16. So if I want to live this life where I have these great expectations uh, before me, uh, my eyes can't see it, my ears can't hear it, and my mind can't even comprehend the wonderful things that God has for me, uh, how will I experience that? and experience uh, the wisdom that God has for me. That's for every believer. It's for the mature, but in this case, that means every, every believer. Well, that's in verses 10 to 16, where we're saying the wisdom of God is not concealed, is not concealed to the believer. Uh, Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God, for what man knows, the things of a man, except the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things uh, that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy, uh, which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So let's go back over this. God's wisdom we're seeing is revealed by his spirit. I think that's pretty obvious in verse 10. 
but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. How do, we, how do we have the wisdom of God? It's revealed by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, yes, uh, the deep, deep things of God. And again, you could read that and underline, oh, the deep things of God. I hope to know the deep things of God one day. If you're a believer, you know the deep things of God. <laughs> Can I know more? Yeah, the Holy Spirit will show you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. It's not, it's not something for, for uh, super Christians or super saints. This is for uh, every believer. Keep in mind that the believers he's writing to here, yeah, they're a gnarly group of people. They're very carnal. I mean, they had a lot of, they didn't have a lot going for them here. And, uh, but he's saying it's for you guys. Man, if it's, it's for them, it's for us. So how does the Spirit reveal these things to us? It's not through the Spirit of the world. Verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit uh, of the world. The spirit of the world is out there, uh, uh, and uh, certainly John writes it about in, in his epistles when he even says the spirit of the Antichrist is already with us. Uh, there's a world that's, that's against the things of God. Uh, there's a world that uh, uh, is against everything we, we say, uh, and we believe, uh, and we hold dear to our, to our hearts, uh, and that uh, spirit is speaking and speaking to you every day. It will speak to you through other people that don't know the Lord. Your husband, I wouldn't put up with that if I were you. You know what my friend Joyce did? That's the spirit of the world. You know, uh, your life, the way you're living, I mean, the advice that people give is unbelievable. And then you get the advice you get from, from television. Again, we talked about that. Uh, it's, all, it's all a philosophy that's, uh, that's driven. Very seldom is it, quote, for, uh, for pure, pure entertainment. Uh, and it doesn't start with you as an adult. It starts with your kids and the cartoons they're watching. And it works its, its way through. Uh, it's the spirit of the world. We won't get any wisdom there. We'll never get to the deep things of God uh, there. Uh, we'll never uh, be growing as the Lord uh, has uh, for us. Uh, and it does work its way into the church. There's a number of years ago, a very, very popular uh, Christian pastor that uh, had uh, started uh, through his church, uh, hundreds of churches, uh, and was a, a solid guy in the Word at one point in time. Uh, and over a period of time, he just began to drift to the wisdom of the world. And he adopted a philosophy uh, that went like this. And on the surface, you can see how this sounds okay. Uh, all truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. Well, you know, so therefore, that sounds okay, Therefore, if I see something within Hinduism that is actually true, I, I, can, I can bring that right into my Christian experience. Because if it's true, it must be from God. Uh, if it's within Buddhism, if it, and he began to draw in to his own Christian experience and over the pulpit uh, and lead astray hundreds of churches because of this premise that all truth is God's truth. No, Paul says there's the wisdom of the world and it's permeating our thinking or our culture. Uh, and we'll never get, uh, get wisdom from it, and we need to be very careful. The wisdom of God comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, and John uh, reveals to us in chapter 14 the, the words of Jesus uh, on this, and certainly that whole upper room discourse is worthy of a, a great deal of study. But just in two verses, uh, Jesus speaks about it in John 14, 16. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you uh, another helper. Uh, again, it means another of the same kind, just like me is the idea, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is going to come. He's trying to prepare his guys for his departure, for his death and for his resurrection. I'm going to send the spirit, another just like me, uh, he will come and he will abide with you forever. That was an issue for uh, Old Testament saints. The Holy Spirit came upon priests, prophets, and kings for them to accomplish a particular task, and then he was gone. That's why the psalmist uh, prayed, and Lord, take not thy spirit from me. We kind of sing the song. It's bad theology. <laughs> uh, Jesus says, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll abide forever. He is the spirit of truth. He is with you. And that's the first ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is with us to convict us of sin and righteousness, the Bible says. Uh, but when we receive Jesus Christ, then he will be in us. And Paul's going to go on in a later chapter and talk about that. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit in whom he dwells. He lives uh, within each uh, and every one of us. 
Uh, and he does that, he says, again in verse 12, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. The deep things of God, freely given to every believer uh, by, by the Holy Spirit. What are they? Well, back in verse 9, they're the things which God prepared for those who, who love him. How do you receive the deep things of God? By becoming a believer, uh, loving God through Jesus Christ, uh, having God's Spirit uh, in you. How do you grow uh, in this relationship with the Holy Spirit? Uh, and I think there is something very valuable here that he, that he says. Uh, and we, we title it this way, God's wisdom is revealed through his word. Uh, that's in verse, verse 13. The things we speak, excuse me, the things we also speak, not in words, uh, which uh, with man's wisdom. Paul's here uh, revealing something very important to us. The things we speak, the we uh, of that verse, the us uh, of verses uh, 12 and 13, also 6 and 7 and verse 10, do not refer to we as believers. Paul is referring to himself and the other apostles. Uh, the things that we speak to you that are going to make a difference in your life. How does the Holy Spirit communicate to you the deep things of God? It's through the Word of God. It's God's Holy Spirit ministering through His Holy Word. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, familiar to us. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's uh, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, 2 Peter 1.20 Peter writing, saying, no prophecy of Scripture, it's just a reference to the New Testament, uh, is of any private interpretation. Nobody gets to decide what it means. I always uh, uh, refer to this when I, uh, uh, what I call Star Starbucks theology. I, I'll be having my coffee at Starbucks, and there'll be three people around a Bible, and they'll go, what do you think it means? I don't know. What do you think it means? Well, I think it means this. Well, I, you know what I mean? I feel like going, I don't do this, of course. I don't have enough David Hawking in me, but uh, I don't got, you know what? It doesn't matter what you think it means. It just matters what it means. That's all. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you think it means. It's just what it means. Uh, it's not open to any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God, the apostles, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The NIV says as they were carried along. It's like, it's like going down a river. It's like God... They weren't, ins I'm inspired, I'll think I'll write something today. No, that's, they, they weren't inspired to write something. Their words, every word was inspired uh, by, by the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying that we, we apostles wrote these things. God's Holy Spirit is revealing the deep things of God. How? Through, uh, through the word of God. Uh, look at verse 13 at the end, something also very interesting, by which the Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. What, what does he mean by that? The spiritual things is, is God's Word. How do you compare spiritual things with spiritual? It's when you compare God's Word with God's Word. Isn't that a... What a thought. You know, we all, sometimes we say, you know, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Uh, and, and, and it really is. And that's what Paul's doing here. He just did it. He's trying to explain something. He says, it's like Isaiah said. Do you remember the story in Isaiah? You're in the captivity. And Isaiah said, this applies to you guys now. That's exactly what he just did. Uh, in the previous chapter, he quotes Isaiah uh, at a time when, uh, when Jerusalem was surrounded by Sennacherib. And he sends down the Assyrians and so forth. And remember, we said, Rob Shaka was on the wall, trash talking everybody. Uh, and uh, Hezekiah had to figure out, does he listen to the wisdom of the world or does he get that letter alone with God and pray and then believe what God said to him through the prophet, the revealed word, uh, word of God? Uh, what is Paul doing? Uh, spiritual things through spiritual. It's, it's why we give cross references. Uh, it's why we believe it's important to know the whole Bible, uh, by the way. Uh, because, uh, again, so much in the New Testament is alluded or is a direct reference to something that takes place uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. And, uh, and it needs to be kind of, uh, you know, a backbone of what we do. How do we explain the Bible? Using the Bible is a really good idea. <laughs> That's what Paul's saying here. This is how the deep things of God are revealed to us, taught to us by the Spirit, revealed to us by uh, His Word. This is another one of those a few decades ago uh, before I, I left on my very first uh, short-term mission trip. Uh, and uh, I got together with Danny Lehman, I know, and I've known Danny for years. He initially discipled me, and, and uh, I was concerned about teaching through, tra through translators, and we were going to be in a lot of different countries. And um, 
Uh, and I talked to him about that, and he had some very, uh, very good words of wisdom and so forth uh, for me. Uh, but he said, uh, basically, he says, most Calvary guys don't have a big problem teaching through translators uh, in, in other cultures and other languages because most of their illustrations come from the Bible. Uh, and as long as you use an illustration from the, from the Bible, then those people out there, regardless of the culture, they're believers, they're going to know when you start talking about, and when Samson went out uh, and he saw, they, they knew who Samson is, they're going to follow right along. Uh, as long as you, most of your illustrations are from the Bible, uh, they're going to completely understand. It's just you lose them when you try to give an illustration about driving in a car in traffic and they've never even seen a car. You know, that's, that's a problem. And uh, we had lots of fun, more fun than I think you're supposed to have on a missions trip one time with uh, uh, Rick Irons and myself and uh, Mike Stengel and uh, Pastor Bill. Uh, Pastor Bill kept wanting to tell this joke. We were in India uh, and it had to do with dating which they don't do. Everything's an arranged marriage. And he could up and tell this joke about dating, and I'm not going to tell the joke now, but uh, <laughs> every time he'd get to the end, and everybody would be, and then he'd have to tell the translator, that's a joke. And then the translator said, would say in whatever the language, that's a joke, please laugh. And uh, <laughs> everybody would laugh, and then our translators would tell us what he just said, and then we'd go on, and we'd get to the next <laughs> training center, and Bill would tell the same joke again, and by then, we were falling off our chairs, laughing, knowing that nobody else was going to laugh. The spiritual things of the Bible are best explained by, by the Bible, uh, Paul, Paul says. And certainly other illustrations are, are helpful. But uh, that's how we learn the deep things of God. God's Holy Spirit working through His Holy Word. God's wisdom, thirdly, is not revealed to the natural man. That's in verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Uh, for their foolishness to him, uh, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Uh, natural here is, uh, is the Greek word psychikos. It's where we get our word psychology. It's really a re reference to the soul of man, sometimes used for uh, personality uh, of man. Uh, and, and for the most part, probably, probably he's talking about an, uh, an unbeliever here. The unbeliever without God's spirit just doesn't get it. Uh, he can't understand it, Paul says. Uh, in, its, uh, in its foolishness uh, to him. Uh, he'll go on to talk about the, uh, the believers in this church in chapter 3, uh, in verse 1, when he says, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you uh, as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes uh, in Christ. So he refers to them as carnal. Uh, is this a reference to them too as well here, the idea? Would he refer to a carnal Christian as a natural man? Uh, there's at least the possibility of that. Uh, so is it possible then to, to, to be a believer and never grow in the deep things of God? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, certainly it is. Uh, we can be open to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can be open to having God speak to us through his word, uh, or we, we can't. We can just live a carnal existence uh, as a believer. That's what was going on in this, uh, this church here. Uh, but uh, that does not receive the things of God uh, is, uh, and, na and cannot know them because they're spiritually discerned, should give cause uh, to all of us to make sure we're humbling ourselves before the Lord and we're experiencing all that he has for us by his spirit through his word. And then uh, lastly, God's wisdom is only revealed to the spiritual man, verse 15. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by, by no one. This is a person who is, again, just living the, what we call the spirit-controlled life. Uh, allowing God's Spirit to uh, uh, work uh, in and through his, his own heart, uh, gaining that uh, information so that it will be transforming uh, in him or her. Verse 15, he who is spiritual judges all things. They have, uh, they have discernment. Uh, they have an eternal perspective uh, about life. Uh, it changes the way we think. It changes our, our outlook about what our lives should be all about. I want to give you two uh, extreme examples one uh, is, uh, I, and I'd done, when the, when the movie was popular, I'd done a whole uh, message one time on the Titanic, and uh, because there's, uh, there's a whole story that, uh, that, of course, is not told through the, the fabrication that is tied into some uh, actual historic uh, events uh, of, of the movie, but uh, uh, in the real story, uh, a couple of things that are very interesting. One is that when they knew the ship was going down and they realized there were not enough lifeboats, 
the Christian men, the Christian men on board help the women and children into the lifeboats and any unbelieving men that they could get in. But no Christian man got in a lifeboat on the Titanic because they knew they were going to be with Jesus. Hey, buddy, you better get, you know the Lord? No, you better get in the boat. We don't have enough. We'll go down with the ship because we're going to be with Jesus. That, that was the perspective. And there's a, wonder, a wonderful testimony of one evangelist in particular that swam from iceberg and floating object to another, leading many people to faith in Christ, the ones that were unsure of their salvation. Some of them survived and told the story, and it is recorded in, in a book. An uh, incident similar to that was uh, repeated uh, just a few years ago and, uh, when the Fukushima nuclear facility began its meltdown after the huge tidal wave hit uh, the uh, Sendai area of, uh, of Japan. Uh, the older Christian workers in that nuclear facility said, we'll go in. Somebody's got to go in and examine the damage and see if there's anything we can do. Anybody that goes in, of course, is going to die. And, and they have, by the way. And, uh, and lots of other people uh, in that area, including uh, lots of school children that were never evacuated far enough and, uh, and uh, have cancer and so forth. Uh, it's kind of out of the news, but it's still part of the history there. But these guys went in, and they chose to go in, and they told the younger guys that didn't know the Lord, you, you stay out, you, you stay, stay away. Uh, that's, that's a believer's perspective on life. Uh, that's, that's God's wisdom versus, what, are, what would the wisdom of man say? Uh, not me, brother, send somebody else, you know. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing this. I'm not volunteering for this. Uh, but believers do. These men knew the, the deep things of God. Uh, again, the, the, old, the, the quote here from the Old Testament uh, is at verse 16 is, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Again, Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 13 also, during the Babylonian captivity. And it's an attempt to comfort God's people. Chapter 40 begins, uh, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Isaiah is trying to comfort the people uh, in their captivity. Uh, and in, in that context of trying to give comfort to them, he says to them, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? He says, uh, no one. But you know what? It's going to, I'm here for you. Things look bad all around you, uh, but things are going to be different in the future. Again, this all relates to uh, the eyes have not seen, uh, the, the ear has not heard the, uh, what God has for them uh, in the future. He says, we have the mind of Christ. Division had come into the church. It was rooted in pride. And uh, Paul calls these believers carnal as a result. He reminds them of the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he reminds them of their own testimonies and what they were before and what they've uh, become now. And he's saying to them and to us, never trade the wisdom of God for the wisdom of this world. Because God has amazing things for us in the future. It doesn't matter what your circumstances look like today. God has amazing things for you. Yes, in heaven one day, but in this life as well. If you suffer today, it's for a reason tomorrow. He'll, he'll never allow the suffering of his children to, <clears throat> to go without use in terms of his, his purposes, what he wants to do in, in our lives and the lives of those, those around us. So Paul reminds us, don't rely on the wisdom of this world, the rulers of this world. It's all going to come to nothing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, you reveal the deep things to us through your word, through your spirit, that uh, we become mature believers uh, in that sense because we've been brought into the body of Christ. Can we grow and become more mature? Uh, there certainly is a, a work going on uh, in our hearts, and Paul will go on and, and, and discuss that. Uh, transformation is not a one-time event. It's uh, over, uh, over our lifetimes. But Lord, wherever we're at today, may we look to you and to your wisdom. Uh, the wisdom of this age, it kind of can permeate our thinking. It could really affect the way we think about you, your plan for our lives, even the way we kind of interpret your word and, uh, and so forth. Lord, so I pray that um, our hearts would be right before you. We would ask you to Again, just fill us afresh of, of your spirit. Use your word. And when we pray, 
uh, when we study, Lord, may we be like the psalmist that says, open my eyes to the wonderful things of your law. Lord, every time we come in here on a Sunday morning, I pray that we would pray, Lord, minister to me, teach me, reveal yourself to me, and do that with some anticipation, because he will. Every time we're at home and we open our Bibles, um, we don't want to do our duty, we want to hear from you. And I pray that we would pray that as we go through your word, your holy scripture, ministering to us through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, uh, if we do that, then uh, we can't even imagine the things you have for us in the future. We pray that you do that in each of our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.